when the business is completely dependent on a founder, that's actually not a firm. That's a practice. Right. A firm, a firm is a real asset, you know, and the value of the firm goes way beyond the value of the founder. Welcome to Spill the Ink, a podcast by Reputation Inc., where we feature experts in growth and brand visibility for law firms and architecture, engineering and construction firms. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Spill the Ink. I'm Michelle Calcote-King. I'm the podcast host, and I'm also the principal and president of Reputation Inc. We're a public relations and content marketing agency for professional services firms. To learn more, go to rep-inc, that's inc with a K, dot com. So today we're talking about professional services firms' growth and scaling. And, you know, a firm's path from a startup to a multi-million dollar business is rarely a straight line. There's turns, curves, peaks, and dips all along the process, making a clear long-term strategy critical to success. So how can professional services firms evaluate and maximize growth scaling and selling opportunities throughout their life cycle. So we're going to explore that today in this episode. And the perfect person to talk to about that is our guest today. So our guest is Greg Alexander. His company, Collective 54, is dedicated to helping boutique professional services firms grow, scale, and exit their business. Before launching Collective 54, Greg ran his own boutique professional services firm, which he eventually sold for $162 million. Wow. He also authored the best-selling book, called The Boutique, How to Start, Scale, and Sell a Professional Services Firm, and he hosts the ProServe podcast. Welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to talk about this. So yeah, tell me a little bit about Collective 54 and the clients that you work with. Collective 54 is what's known as a mastermind community. It's the first of its kind in that it's focused exclusively on the unique needs of the thriving boutique ProServe firm. Members come in three kind of flavors, if you will. There's growth members, and these tend to be younger firms, maybe in the early days of their um, journey. And they're trying to kind of figure out, you know, how to survive, um, yep. how to grow to a certain level, et cetera. The next phase is the scaling phase. And we got a group of members there and they're no longer worrying about surviving, but they're working 70 hours a week and they kind of want to figure out how to work smarter, not harder. And then the third group is the exit group, and they've been doing it a long time. They want to do something else with their lives, and they need to figure out how to sell their firms. And selling a professional services firm is a very nuanced thing, so we help them with that. The number 54 is in the name Collective 54 because that's the North American classification code for professional services. So what's in that is what you might think. Law firms, accounting firms, consulting firms, marketing agencies, IT service providers, architects, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty much experts that yeah. uh, sell and deliver their expertise. Love it. I'd love to hear a little bit about your background in selling a, a firm for a, such a draw dropping number. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So the name of the firm was called SBI. I started that firm in 2006. And it was a management consulting firm in kind of a classic sense of the word. We were heavily niched. We focused on business-to-business -business sales effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Our client base was a blend between kind of the global 2000, so people that, you know, had huge investments in large sales forces, and also private equity firms that would buy companies, and their thesis around buying the companies was to grow them. So our services were in demand there. Um, yeah. In 2017, yeah, we sold that firm to private equity, and the, the price was 162 million. And, and I share that number not to be braggadocious and sometimes it comes across the wrong way, but I share that to inspire people that say, yeah. you know, a service firm can actually pull this off because it, it bothers me when they say services firms can't scale and services firms can't exit and they're not wealth creating. That's not true. And I'm a walking example of that. Yeah, absolutely. What better proof point that you know what you're talking about to, to help firms scale. So um, absolutely. Along your path, what were some of the those key things that you did right? I'm going to also ask you what you did wrong, uh, yeah. but that were kind of critical to scaling and exiting the business that are now kind of foundational to your your work with clients. Yeah. So there were several. I'll, I'll try to categorize them into the three steps of the journey. I like yeah. to say that a boutique goes on a life cycle. It's about 15 years on average, start to finish. 
there's three stages, growth, scale, and exit, about five years in each stage. So for me, in the growth stage, the critical things were make sure that I knew the problem that I was solving for the client. And in the early days, the mistake I made was that I was running around with a solution looking for a problem, and that's very difficult to be successful. So we switched that, got really focused on what the problem was, and that really helped. The second thing in the growth stage, I would say, is you got really tight on who our ideal client profile was, because when you're a small company, you have limited resources. There's only so many hours in the day, dollars in the bank, and heads on the, on the org chart. So concentrating those resources against an ideal client profile was super important for us, and that allowed us to grow a lot. When we got to the scale stage, it was about working smarter, not harder. So specifically what that meant was generating revenue from things other than the billable hour. It was tech enabling service delivery. So we could be that much more productive on a revenue per head basis. It was leveraging global talent in different geographies around the world. And it was getting really smart on how we priced our services. And those things really kicked the scale engine into gear. And then when we got to the exit stage, it really came down to three things. It came down to profit margin. We were very profitable. It came down to the business not being dependent on me, the founder, because it's tough to buy a firm when it's dependent on one person. And about uh, reducing client concentration. So a lot of services companies, they look good on paper, but when you double click, they got two or three clients and a 40, 50% of the revenue, and that's too risky. You know, for right. some advice. So those are some of the things that we did along the way that helped quite a bit. And those are the things that we teach Collective 54 members in addition to others. That's great. What are some of the things along your journey that you wish you'd done differently that you kind of help clients see and avoid? Yeah, I would say that uh, we took too long. So we should have made it through the growth stage instead of five years, probably could have got there in two or three years. But I was a first time founder figuring this stuff out on my own. And, uh, you know, I just didn't know any better. So I made a lot of mistakes. So the advice I'd give your audience is to tap into mastermind communities, whether it's mine or somebody else's, being around peers can really help because you can avoid paying some dumb taxes. I would say in the scale stage, I probably didn't get serious enough about succession planning because when I got to the exit stage, you know, everybody wanted to know, could the business run without me? We were able to prove that that was true and the, and the firm has done very well since I've left, but there was a lot of convincing there. You know, if I got engaged in succession planning much earlier, it would have made my life a lot easier. And then third, I would probably say investing in new service delivery. We didn't do that fast enough. You know, when things are going well, you think they're going to go well forever. And then one day we woke up and we had this gold plated client roster and you know, in the early days, we were a one-trick pony selling one thing. Eventually, we migrated not only from sales effectiveness, but to marketing, to product, to general management. And I would have done that faster. So the advice mm. to your audience members is to expand the service offerings as quickly as possible. Interesting. So how does that compare to kind of the prevailing wisdom around being very niche focused? So you mentioned being very kind of niche early on. So expanding service offerings, are you still doing that within a niche? How do you balance that? Yeah, everything comes back to the fundamental problem we were solving. And that problem mm -hmm. was we helped our clients grow their revenue stream faster than their competitors. Mm -hmm. That was the niche. And that was a really tight niche. But within our client base, there were a lot of people working on that problem. There was a sales leader, of course, and that was our first uh, type of client. But marketing is heavily involved. Product company, I mean, the product leader spending a lot of money bringing out new products. This is a top of mind issue for the CEO, et cetera. So it was still the same very tight niche, but mm -hmm. we were expanding from function to function within that niche that allowed us to really grow. Nice. Okay. I'm curious, just because we work with professional services firms, we work with law firms, architecture firms, engineering firms, that kind of thing. Do you find any differences between the types of professional services firms that you work with and the types of problems that they tend to encounter or ways that they're scaling? This is a great question, and it's somewhat of a religious battle, so I'm glad that you asked it. In my point of view, they're much less different than they think they are because they operate off the same business model. And that business model is their marketing, selling, and delivering expertise. Now, where they differ is the expertise that they sell. I mean, law firms and marketing agencies on paper don't look like they have a lot in common because their domain expertise is so different. However, their business model is identical. They still mm. have to win clients. They still have to hire people. They still have to scope work correctly. 
They still have to manage to a certain margin profile, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The business model is identical, mm -hmm. but the domain is different. Interesting. I'm a member of a mastermind. Tell me a little bit about how it works and for maybe folks who aren't familiar with what masterminds are. Yeah. So the principle of mastermind community is peer-to-peer -peer learning. Mm -hmm. And so the key, all uh, wonderful mastermind groups have six components to them. And we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, people that came before us. And these are the six that have been around for, I don't know, a hundred years. So number one is you got to build the network, the network of peers. And they have to be real peers. You know, what frustrates some is they join a community and they realize that this isn't their peeps. This isn't their tribe. And they're like, these really aren't my peers. So it has to be a high quality network. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, they got to produce interesting and insightful content. And that content is usually user generated content. It bubbles up from that network. I think that's going to be particularly important going forward because we're living in the age of AI where content is going to become a commodity. But when you have, when the content is coming from your peers, it's not a commodity. So it's very unique. The third thing is data. All mastermind communities provide benchmarking data. So for example, are you charging enough for your services? Are you earning enough from a margin perspective? So being able to see the data of other members is really important. Number four is software. So most mastermind communities have wonderful member directory. So you're only a click away from getting access to help. These days, much like a social media feed, they have that. So you can get instantaneous help. One of our members calls it the human Google. So that's one. The next is events. So thankfully, the pandemic is behind us. So we want to get together and, uh, you know, go to events. That's not just uh, sitting in a Las Vegas conference room with 5,000 of your friends, rather going to an intimate event with maybe 100 of your peers, as an example. Right. right. And then the last one is coaching. And coaching comes in many forms. I can get coached by a mentor. I can be a mentee. Or I can get coached by, like, we have an advisory board that's handpicked individuals that happen to be experts. It's something that's relevant to our members, et cetera. So those are the six items that are present in the best mastermind communities and certainly the six things that we built in Collective 54. And those are the six things that our members get value from. When you say content, what do you mean by that? We're a thought leadership content firm. So are you talking about just content that you're sharing amongst members or these are firms that are generating great thought leadership content on a regular basis and sharing it with each other? Explain that it's, a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not a thought leadership content. I'm glad you asked that clarifying question. It's kind yeah. of like in the guts content. So what I mean by that is like, I just got off of a member call and one member was sharing his template or a forecast. Because a lot of our members are really struggling with matching revenue and expenses because there's some um, volatility in the economy. And everybody knows that they have to create a forecast, but that's a big word. For, that word forecast is at 30,000 feet. How do I you know, get a running start by, you know, stealing somebody else's templates on 80% of the way there when I get started. It's that kind of content, very practical, how to best practice style content. Got it. Okay. Well, one of the things that I often see with firms, especially professional services firms, and especially law firms, is sort of that founder bottleneck. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you help firms overcome that? Because I assume that's probably the number one critical thing that most firms uh, face when trying to to scale to the next level. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, someone once told me along the way is that you start your firm to go into business for yourself. Then you wake up one day and you realize you're not in business for yourself. You're working for your clients. Then as your journey continues, you wake up one day and you're not working for yourself, your clients, you're working for your employees. And then at the end of that journey, you wake up one day and added to yourself, clients and employees end up working for the investors of the bank. And that's, that's very, very true. So when the business is completely dependent on a founder, that's actually not a firm. That's a practice, right? A firm, a firm is a real asset, you know, and the value of the firm goes way beyond the value of the founder. You know, sometimes, you know, like in our community, most of our members, in fact, about 90% of them, this is the first firm they've ever started. So they don't necessarily know this yes, yet. And the separation between firm and founder hasn't happened yet. But it's mission critical for it to happen because in the end, scaling a firm is just too much work for one person. Mm -hmm. as, you, as you get bigger, you know, 
you just, you can't get to what it is you're trying to get to if you're one person. So building a bankable executive management team mm -hmm. is mission critical and being an effective delegator to that management team is a critical element in scale. I will tell you, it's something that most first time founders get wrong mm -hmm. because let's face it, the, the profile of a founder is, you know, they're fiercely independent, somewhat stubborn people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And they can suffer from micromanagement and delegating is a tough thing for them and trusting other people is a tough thing for them. So they got to get over that, you know, if mm -hmm. they truly want to scale their firm. Yeah. I noticed in your blog that you talk a little bit about growth by acquisition versus organic growth. How do you help firms determine what strategy is best for them and help them kind of find their way with that? Yeah. Well, the way that we discuss growth is the first thing to do is to grow your current clients, expansion your revenue from your current clients. So having an effective account management team in place that can spot new opportunity in the current client base is the, is the first strategy. When you get out of the growth stage and you get to the scale stage, the revenue growth switches from acquiring new clients to expanding existing clients. New clients are always important, don't get me wrong, but the majority of the growth is going to come from expanding your current clients. Because in the scale stage, that's what you have now. You have a client roster. In the early days, you don't really have a client roster, so all your revenue is coming from new clients. So that's the first thing. Now, what do you have to do to expand revenue with your existing clients? Well, you have to come up with new services. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that is the lowest risk, highest probability way to grow your firm. Mm -hmm. Now, if, and if you have a services roadmap that says, hey, I need to develop these services over the next two, three, four, five years, yeah. it may make sense to buy a company, buy a firm that already has that service and bring them in. Where that right. works is when you have demand in your client roster for that service. Mm -hmm. so just by that firm being part of your firm, you're going to exponentially grow their revenue because you're mm -hmm. going to take that new service to your client base. Where it doesn't work is when you buy a competitor. One plus one oftentimes equals 0.5 there because mm -hmm. there's, there's too much client overlap. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's just, it's not expanding the pie. It's mm -hmm. just a defensive move to get rid of a pesky competitor. Got it. Interesting. What do you see are those kind of typical signs that it's time for a founder to exit? What are founders normally experiencing when they get to that third stage yeah. um, and they're looking to, to sell? Well, there's a few things. First, the job satisfaction of the founder plummets mm -hmm. because they're a long way away from the early days. You know, founders are pioneers. They like to be on the razor's edge and be out there trying new things. But scaling is in contrast to that. Scaling is doing more of what you've already done, just doing it better, faster, cheaper. And sometimes founders don't like that. So that's the first thing I would say. Meaning founders are just sort of like a shiny object syndrome. Is that kind of what you're, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. Yeah, what, and it's scaling. hard to kind of stick and just exactly. optimize. Okay, yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, um, so that would be one. The second one would be is that the kind of market responsiveness is the way I would say it, of the firm is degrading because the people in the firm have not been empowered to make decisions. You know, kind of all roads run through the founder. And when a firm gets busy, the decision-making cycle can get long. Mm -hmm. You know, the remedy to that is to push decision-making power to those closest to the client so they can be super responsive in the marketplace. So that's one. Another one would be lack of growth, top-line mm -hmm. revenue growth. Because again, it's too much work for one person. So you might have a business that was growing 30% a year for 10 years. And then all of a sudden it's growing at 20, 10, 5% because the founder is in the way, strangling the growth. And then the last one, which is an easy one, is age. You know, founders, they start their firms. The average age, and this was reported by Harvard Business Review, I believe, of a founder of a professional services firm is 44. Which really? Is, oh, wow. Okay. Isn't that surprising? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so our belief is it takes 15 years approximately on average to go from cradle to grave. So if you push 15 years on top of 44, so now all of a sudden, I mean, you're in the retirement age. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's time to move on at that point. And can mm -hmm. you, know, you have the next generation that can take the baton from you at that point in time? And that doesn't happen overnight. It can take three, four, five years to get the next generation ready to take over. Yeah, absolutely. I would have thought it would have taken longer. So what does an ideal 
exit strategy look like? Give me a few of those ideal things that you've got to have. Yeah, asking, I'll give for, you, asking for a friend. Yeah, sure. I'll give you the qualitative and quantitative. So qualitative is that you as the founder are at peace with it. You know, mm-hmm. you've decided that uh, you've been validated and it's time for you to move on and you're not going to have any kind of seller's regret after the fact. So that's number one. Number two is along the way, you probably have some very loyal employees that are approaching family member status. So you want to make sure that when you leave, that those employees are very well taken care of. Mm-hmm. So that's the second requirement. And the third requirement is similar, and that is clients. You probably have some long-standing clients that you care about and you have some relationships with, and you probably want to make sure that they continue to be well-served you know, after your departure. Now, on the quantitative side, it really comes down to two things, and that is what's the purchase price that you sell your firm for? And do you feel good that you're being fairly compensated for the asset that you created? And then the second thing is, what are the terms of the deal? You know, depending on who you sell to, like if you sell to private equity, that could be an equity role. If you sell to a strategic, that could be an earnout. If you sell to your employees, it could be a seller's note. So the, the terms of the deal matter just as much as the purchase price. And as part of your mastermind, it sounds like if you're in that third stage, you have access to all of those sorts of experts to help guide you, all those different, that's fantastic. I love the fact that you break it up into those three different stages. You know, even my mastermind that I'm a member of, you've got a lot of people at different stages of their journey. I mean, and it's all marketing agencies, but um, that does make a difference. Absolutely. It does. And that's why we did it. And that comes back to the fundamental principle of a mastermind. It's got to be real peers. You Mm -hmm. might be a marketing agency, but you could be at drastically different points of the journey and dealing with different issues, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just different desires, wants, yeah, which goes along with that stage of of growth. So I've got two more questions for my own benefit. How much does reputation and brand play a role in a professional services sale? Oh, it's essential. I mean, professional services is an intangible. So it, it's not like you go to buy a car, you can take a test drive. With professional services, you really can't do that. Right. So what stands in substitute to be able to demo the product, if you will, is the reputation. Mm-hmm. If you're an expert, that's what you're trading on. You know, mm-hmm. your people are looking to you to be an expert and, and it's so much critical. That's why when I got to know you a little bit, you know, I know that you focus on that a lot. And, you know, how does a professional services founder establish a reputation? Well, there's the traditional ways, like, for example, you mentioned my book, the boutique mm-hmm. kind of stuff, scale and sell a professional services firm. So a book is a great way to do that, you know, but I also have a blog and I've got a podcast, I got a YouTube channel, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you have to establish your reputation and, you know, the best way of course is to do great work because word of mouth is mission critical, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the price of entry. Yeah. hundred percent. Tell me what is the most important lesson if you had to sum it all up that you hope our listeners take away from, from this conversation? Don't go it alone. Um, being a founder of a pro serve firm is hard. I have this thing I talk about the founder's trail. And, you know, when you step on the founder's trail, think of that as like a trail towards, you know, climbing up a mountain, if you will. You step on a founder's trail, you're leaving, God forbid, all the cowards behind because it takes a lot of courage just to step on the trail. Yeah. And then as you go along the trail, kind of the weak die off because not everybody can go through the three phases. There's a ton of small business owners which is very few entrepreneurs. A small business owner is someone who's running a nice little practice paying the bills. An entrepreneur is someone who's building a firm that's someday going to be worth a lot of money. So as the week kind of die off along the way, you know, you reach that top, that pinnacle, if you will. And along the way, it's, it's such a bumpy ride that a lot of self-doubt will creep in and you might give up too early if you don't surround yourself with a peer group. But being around a peer group, there'll be that support system that you need to keep pushing when at times it looks like, geez, this might be too hard. Just hang in there. So don't go in alone would be my advice. I love it. It's so true. I've heard often people talk and I experience this a lot. It's a very lonely experience too, to found a company. You have no cohorts in the early days. And then, you, you know, that th- those colleagues that you used to have, there's suddenly that gap. So that's what masterminds are great for. Right. You suddenly have someone to at least 
ask questions to, but also just complain when you need it or have that, you know, just that group to to talk to or going through the same thing as you. And it, it is invaluable. So, um, well, thank you so much. So we have been talking to Greg Alexander of Collective 54. Where's the best place for people to learn about you and especially to to buy your book? Yeah, so the book is on Amazon. Again, it's the boutique, How to Start, Scale, Sell, a professional services firm by Greg Alexander. Um, the website is collective54.com. That's the number five, four. And on the website, I would encourage all of you to subscribe to our newsletter, which is called Collective 54 Insights. And there you'll get a blog, a podcast, a video, a bunch of content beyond the book. And if you're interested in uh, you know, meeting peers and being in a mastermind community, consider applying. You can fill out a contact us form on the website and one of our representatives will be in contact with you. Great. Well, thank you so much. All right. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Spill the Ink, a podcast by Reputation Inc. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.